Don't ever take somebody's excuse that it was the recession that caused their downside. Because the boom caused their upside. Because anybody can fail. Anybody. And I fail and make mistakes every day. But I try very hard to learn from those mistakes. And the most important thing is, don't believe your own hype. It's by the experience of life and the experience that you're going through that allows you to monitor through it. But in that recession, it did bring me to my knees. I lost everything. Um, I virtually went bankrupt. It was like somebody put a fence around the business and said, toxic, stay out. And that's how hard it hit. No different to what we're in now. You really get to see people for what they are when your back is up against the wall. But the most important thing is to be focused on what you want to be, whether it's an electrician, whether it's a plumber, whether it's a computer programmer, whether it's a footballer. It's all about the people around you. And the one piece of advice that I would give to anybody is always look at your circle very, very deeply. We had uh, a rotary failure, but I managed to get the helicopter down, but as it was coming down, it hit, uh, hit the ground hard and had vertical rollover. But I got myself out, the pilot was knocked out because I was there with a trainee pilot. I pulled him out and he was in intensive care for a week. But, and I got out with a nick underneath my face. To be fair with you, I grabbed the machete um, and took it off of him because he didn't have the kahunas to use it. It does come with a stigma, no question about that. Let's, let's not try and hide behind words. But that only means that the bar's set a little bit higher for me. So that means I have to try a little bit harder. That means I have to work a little bit harder. I'd always be with my own people. Why? Because we've been persecuted for so long. I'm one of the few people, especially in business, that has ever come out. Hi guys and welcome back to KRN TV. We're bringing the most exciting interviews from around the world. Today it's delighted to be at the HQ of Wild Crest Parks with the main man himself, Alfie Best. Alfie, how are we doing? All good and thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, so if people don't know Alfie, he has the most incredible rags to riches story from being born in a caravan on the roadside to now being worth over 700 million and being number 341 on Britain's rich list. Um, over the past 30 years, he's acquired the most incredible empire um, with, I believe, 90, well, it was 91 mobile home sites, but I saw you acquired two yesterday, so I know now, yeah. it's constantly growing. Um, he is Europe's number one. Um, he also owns six or seven holiday homes, um, parks, 15 mobile uh, home parks in America, golf course, football club, huge portfolio of commercial and residential properties, Room Mobile Home Rentals, Training Academy, Publishing Company, and I'm sure lots more that I've missed out. Is there anything of sort of major note that we should? You know, our two main companies is uh, is Wildcrest Parks and Varun Motorhome Hire. Yes. There are two major companies, but we have others uh, like Barbados VIP Villas, um, and uh, you know we have Training Academies and such and so on. Well, I'll just start saying massive congratulations uh, with okay. all your success over the last 30 years, Alfie. Absolutely incredible. Um, so Alfie's started numerous TV programs over the years, most recently Undercover Big Boss and ITV, which came out last week or the weekend before, which absolutely fantastic watch. Um, and I heavily recommend uh, that to anyone who hasn't seen it. Thank you. So with um, all our guests, we'd like to go back into sort of their early life, and obviously especially with yours, to see what sort of shaped them into the person they are today, um, if possible. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your sort of childhood, your family, the family setting, siblings, schooling, and go back there if possible, Alfie. Yeah, sure. So um, obviously we've heard you were born 
So obviously to travel with parents on in a caravan on the roadside. Whereabouts were you raised? Okay, I'm an East Londoner through and through, and um, but we travelled all around the country. But it was where we wintered, and I'm potentially you could say at a forest gate. But I was born uh, in a caravan in a place called Lutterworth, which is near Leicester. Um, we lived in caravans, and I don't think it was abnormal at that time for, um, for children to be born at home. Um, I think, you know, now we just assume that everybody has to be born in a hospital. But I, I think, you know, you go back, you know, 50 years and beyond, I don't think it was that uh, abnormal to be born at, at home. And I was born in a caravan. Um, it, you know, and I hear that people use the, you know, story rags to riches and this that, and the other. And I'm, I'm going to be really honest, we were poor, but we didn't feel poor. I didn't feel poor, we weren't starving. But if you measure it in monetary terms, then we were poor. But from a loving family and a family of, you know, from first cousins, I come from a very, very, very big family, um, that uh, I couldn't ask for better people. Absolutely. And so, um, was your dad a good businessman, though, sort of growing up? Did you learn a lot of the skills you have today from your dad? Were they sort of passed on? Yeah, I learned a lot of skill sets from dad, a lot of learned skill sets from my mum. Um, I've learned a lot of skill sets from my son, and I'll continue to uh, to learn. Was my dad an astute businessman, uh, as opposed to saying being a good businessman? Um, my dad was a worker. You know, he's a workaholic. He's that. He's got. If if you ask me to describe my dad in the terms of a car, my dad would be a tractor. Just keeps going. The engine just doesn't stop yes. and believe it or not he's 76 years old and this is not an exaggeration he works seven days a week and it's manual work oh and, and and i constantly say to him come on now but i'm an expert i would say in retirement and this is what i would say to everybody don't ever retire keeps the mind occupied keeps the mind active keeps the body young and makes you a younger person absolutely well, it looks like he certainly passed his work ethic on to you, obviously, um, which is obviously a massive key, I'm guessing, in the success. Um, so talk to me about your schooling, Alfie. I know that you left school at a early age. Um, was that sort of your parents that sort of recommended you do that, or was that you wanting to get out into the real world at the earliest possible stage? And uh, what age was it, Alfie, that you left school? I actually left school at 12, but my schooling was periodic. And, um, you know, I was in and out of school. I wasn't particularly good at reading and writing. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, in the traveling community, why they tend, one of the things that they tend to also take their children out of is sex education came into schools. And, you know, that's a big thing among the traveling community, you know, that, uh, uh, that your morals are correct, uh, especially where uh, young men and, and women are concerned. Or young girls, so they're one of the reasons that also travellers take their children out of school. They don't. I remember when uh, at twelve, when sex education came into the school, my mum stopped me from going to the school for those two weeks, um, and that had a form of bullying afterwards on that. Yeah. But all of those little factors, and the reason that this makes a difference is I saw Denzel Washington, and he made a, a, a statement. They asked him about. Um, why he employed a black director to direct a film. And he replied straight away, and I was, I was astounded by it, because it was a fantastic um, way of putting it. He said, it's got nothing to do with colour. He said, it's about culture. He said, it's about understanding people's culture. He said, that's why he said, um, Steven Spielberg made a great film with Schindler's List, because he's from a Jewish background. Yeah. You know, Martin Scorsese, you know, made good fellas. It's from an Italian background. Yeah. It's about culture. And actually, when you look at it, it's about what shines out in those films. Same with Gypsies. There hasn't been anybody yet made a real Gypsy film that actually shows the true culture. What we've had is cartoon-like features like The Big Fat Gypsy Wedding and such forth and so on. Yeah. But there's been no true portrayals yes. of 
I would say, the hidden life of gypsies. Yes, absolutely. Because, um, like you say, it's, it's kind of cartoon. Like a lot of the, you see a lot of the titles of the programs that the Gypsy and Traveller community I interviewed Tony Giles a couple of days ago. It was Big Fat Gypsy Re Wedding, Big Fat Gypsy yep. This, Gypsy Next Door. Here come the gypsies. And, yep. And all the titles are a little bit discriminatory, aren't they? Um, Look, they're only discriminative if you allow them to be. For me, um, I believe that you know being a gypsy does come with a stigma. There's no question about that. Let's let's not try and hide behind words. But that only means that the bar's set a little bit higher for me. So that means I have to try a little bit harder. That means I have to work a little bit harder. It doesn't necessarily mean to say I'm going to be smarter, because I'm not. But I certainly have people who work with me that are. Yes, indeed. So uh, it's all about employing the right people. Yeah, yeah. the right team. Absolutely. So like I so said, you left school at 12 years old, but you'd only be going periodically before that. Was that to work with your dad, sort of helping him out with the tarmac? And then obviously I know you got involved in the cars and the motor trade at an early age at the same time. From you? the age of eight, I was, I was working with my dad. I'm not saying full time. Jesus, yeah. But I was at work. Now where we... Um... <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me, apologies. Bless you, um, Where we lived, or we what, what you would call wintered, which is when you'd go back in the winter and you'd, you'd pull the caravan on hard standing, you'd winter there. There were some train line gates. And from the age of eight, I would go up to those train line gates all day, from seven in the morning till six at night, opening the gates, because they weren't electric. And you'd hold your hand out. And that was my first sense of real business. Because the people that didn't tip you, you didn't open the gate again. And they sort of learned very quickly. Yes. Because they didn't want to get out of their cars in the cold and the snow. They would be happy to buy. And I saved up, believe it or not, over a period of nearly three years, I saved up £1,800. Now, we're going back 40 years. And we're talking about out of 10 pences and 5 pences, because that's the sort of tips you got at the time. Fantastic. So you've always had that uh, sort of saving streak to you. Yep. And so talk to me about getting into the, the motor business then. Um, what made you get into this? Was your dad sort of dabbling in motors at all? or? Yeah, my, look, my dad did used to buy and sell uh, escort vans and that type of thing. But um, we used to, as travellers, we used to go to... Um, um, what you would call travellers fairs so there used to be Epsom there used to be Cambridge um, York and such forth and so on Doncaster Fair Musselborough Appleby all of those types of fairs that you'd pull to and there was one particular man called Nelson Clark and Nelson Clark was the first traveller that I ever saw have a Rolls Royce and I was impressed you know you didn't see travellers at that age, at that day and age, to have money. And uh, I wondered what he did. So I, I uh, obviously found out that he did commercial vehicles. And uh, obviously I'd had a spell doing that because I'd seen my dad do escort vans. And that's really what made me get into doing commercial vehicles. And what I'd do is I'd go to the auctions. I'd buy Land Rovers in London and send them to Wales and put them in another auction. And I'd then buy minis or escorts, whatever, that were automatic and send them back to London because automatic cars people wanted in the city. Land Rovers, they always wanted for the country. It's only just lately, over the last 15 years, that Land Rovers have become fashionable in yeah. London and they even want automatics in those. So it's about finding the niche that fits for each... Um, for each segment that you're doing. Yeah, you're very astute at that young age to be sort of using the geographical know-how in terms of that and... Well, that comes from being a traveller and knowing the, de uh, the demographics of the country. Yeah. Because we'd been to Wales, we'd been to Scotland, we'd been to Doncaster, York, Coventry, you know. We'd been all over the UK travelling and working. So, for me, it wasn't a big thing. Um, and that, you know, so for that I use to my benefit. Mm, absolutely. Well, congratulations. Well done. Like I said, I read about that in your book um, in the past week. And so, for guys who don't know, Alfie has got a great book on Amazon Kindle and Amazon. 
get that and find out some more secrets about him. It's a fantastic book. When I wrote the book, I wrote the book so I wanted to make it very simple. Yeah. So it kept people reading it because I tend to find, and I'm not the best reader in the world, yeah. but I tend to find read books can be so complicatedly and you have to read it twice to understand it. Yeah. Maybe that's just me. I wanted it very simple and I wanted the skill sets, which are real simple for me, to come out to people. And I wanted them to be able to take sentences out to be able to change their life. Yeah. And that's why I wrote the book. No, it was uh, fantastic and it definitely did do those things that you said. It was a nice short book, very concise. And rather than a story, but it was a self-help book. I yes, think it has. 100%. And um, I was giving Rick a little the quotes out of it that were written in the big and it was... Um, and, that's what it, and that's what it was written for. It's actually written, the more people we help, the more people become, we become on their lips. Yeah. And by becoming on their lips, we become the expert of our industry. So that's then who people will look to go to. Yeah, indeed, it was fantastic. And it's, uh, the book's called, Can Anyone Build a Property Empire? Yes, and uh, there'll be a link below in the description for that. And like I say, it's actually on a deal in Kindle at the moment. So I heavily recommend people get on it at the moment while <laughs> it's there. And um, like I say, it's all about saving money, isn't it? Of course, it? absolutely. So um, you did quite well at the motor trade over a few year period, but unfortunately you were hit with the recession um, when you got to about 18, 19 years old, wasn't it, Alfie? And obviously that was a huge hit for you, wasn't it? I wasn't hit with the recession. Yeah. I was hit with lack of knowledge. Okay. I was hit, there's a big difference. Don't ever take somebody's excuse that it was the recession that caused their downside because the boom caused their upside. Yeah. We've got to take both of them in both measures. Now we're heading for another recession. And I'm very conscious of that. If I fail in that recession, and don't think for one minute that I can't fail, because anybody can fail, anybody. And I fail and make mistakes every day. But I try very hard to learn from those mistakes. And the most important thing is, don't believe your own hype. Don't believe your own hype. Be concise with what you are, be confident about what you're doing. But believe in yourself without believing your own salesmanship. Mm. That makes sense? Absolutely. Now, when the recession hit, I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. Hadn't been through it. Didn't know what to expect. I expected Monday to be just like the next Monday and the Monday after, because this is what we did. What I really didn't know was life's not like that. Life is not like that. Life is like driving a car. You don't know who's gonna run out in front of you. You don't know if the other person's going to drive into you. You don't know if you're going to have a lapse of com yeah. of mental block. You don't know whether or not you're going to jump the traffic lights by mistake. Anything can happen in life. It's like driving the car. You don't know how the weather's going to change. And all of a sudden the window wipers don't work. Things get thrown at you. It's by the experience of life and the experience that you're going through that allows you to monitor through it. But in that recession, it did bring me to my knees. I lost everything. Um, I virtually went bankrupt. And if it wasn't through a real bad issue that I had, the banks would have made me bankrupt. But I was in a position called negative equity. So I had a beautiful house that was half a million pound, but with a 250,000 pound mortgage. I had a car pitch that was worth 250 grand with a 125,000 pound mortgage. But overnight, and I mean overnight, within a matter of four weeks, it was like somebody put a fence around the business and said, toxic, stay out. And that's how hard it hit. No different to what we're in now. We have a famine or a feast in this COVID environment. I don't agree with what the government has done to some businesses, which I'll come to in a minute. I think they made such a harrowing mistake that it was untrue. And uh, I'm still wondering how they're going to pay for that mistake. Um, because it was such a bad mistake and it also told me something. The government knows nothing about business. Knows absolutely nothing about business. 
It may think it does, but through the mistakes that they made in the COVID environment of what we had here, they know nothing about business. Mm. And, and, and I'll come to that. But going back to the recession was, it was actually the negative debt that saved me because it stopped the banks foreclosing. Because they still want to pay money. Yes. So even though at the time I felt, my God, what am I going to do? And, but what I did do was I moved out of my house, slept in an escort van with a mattress in the back, rented the house out, because even though it was a hardship for me in that recession, and it was the 1990 recession, I always get, get them mixed up, but it was 1990, and I was 20 years old. Even though I was having a hard time, there was other people that were booming in that recession, and I saw that. So I moved out, rented the house out, managed to pay my mortgage. I did the same with the, with the car site. Moved out of it, broke it up, paid the mortgage. And um, you really get to see people for what they are when your back is up against the wall. And uh, there was a, there's a couple of people that I remember vividly um, that uh, were more than trying to put their foot on my forehead to push me underwater. Um, and uh, I would never repay the favour, but I would never lend a hand of help. Because you need to be able to create that backbone to know that people can't use you and shouldn't use you. You must know your own value. From there, um, I then got a job. And I hadn't, didn't have money to do research. So what I did was I drove around looking for businesses that had queues. And there was two I found. One was mobile phones and one was takeaway foods. And takeaway foods it was too much of a, uh, an expensive setup cost. Mobile phones was new, unbelievable. You buy this, it had no wire and you know you could make a call. It was crazy. It's, you know, when I think about it now, it's what, it's 30 years ago, but it was, reminds me of that film, the uh, uh, Beverly Hillbillies, where, the, where Granny is in the back of the limo and she goes, look, he's using the phone and he's nobody on there because there's no wire. It, it, crazy stuff. Yeah. Because before, you had a dial-in time. I remember as a kid, it's just crazy. All of a sudden you had this box you could make a call. Anyway, I got into that. Uh, I worked there for, I don't know, six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Um, got 70 pounds a week. Started off really pretty much making the tea. Um, um, I progressed to a salesman, but all I was there for because I wanted to learn their business. And um, I did that. I opened 18 stores in 18 months. Had no money to do it when I first started it, so what I did was I managed to get shops that nobody wanted, rent free, um, decorated, tidied them up myself, because at the time we were in a recession, and just like you go down the high street now, and you see shops shutting and closing, they're paying the rates. Yep. So they're happy to get somebody in there to cover that rates for a 12 month period. It's good to know, it's some good advice for the people out there. But it, but it works. You know, there, there's no such thing as calm. So we opened up 18 stores. Virtually all of those stores we opened up were rent free um, for at least a period of a year. Some of them, believe it or not, were even for three years. We then sold out to a subsidiary of Vodafone I then, but before I did that, I bought all the freeholds of all the shops and rented them to the company that was trading, selling the phones. So now when I sold out, I then became, my value of my property doubled overnight because they were now let to a blue chip company. So then I became a landlord to, of a blue chip property company. Yes. Um, I carried on, I then carried on building the commercial property company and then in 2001 I bought my first mobile home park 
And um, the mobile home park uh, that I bought was called Lakeview Park. Uh, we've built that business over the, over the last 20 years. I'm sorry to pause you for two seconds. What led you to obviously decide to make the decision to get involved in the mobile home park? Because then after that period of time, you obviously been very successful with property, phone yeah. and stuff. Well, to be fair, um, to be fair with you, being a gypsy, I'm born and bred in a caravan. So why on earth would I not be involved in a business that is the lifeblood that flows through my veins? And I would say I was, you know, without any shadow of a doubt, it's a passion. And when I then bought the first park, which was, was close to us, um, or where we lived at the time, and um, I then started to understand the business and learn from the business, but I was learning on the ground. And I then realised this was the solution to the UK's housing problem, to the affordable housing. Here's the reason why. You can buy a park home for 50% less than a like-for-like -like bungalow or less in the same area you have band A council tax. You have no land registry fee, no stamp duty. Electricity is 23 to 28% less. The reason being is per the electricity is purchased through a mainframe commercial meter at the front of the park that is then subdivided at cost, so it's at a cheaper rate. So why does the government not support this? because it's not financially beneficial, because they don't get no stamp duty. They're getting the lowest council tax band A. And the savings for the resident, they're freeing up capital in their home and giving them the life that they never had. They're living in a like-minded community. So for those reasons, the business has exploded. And we're the first people that have really brought together corporate functional business within this sector. Before it was just a cottage style industry, very fragmented. So for us and for me, I'm very privileged because I've put together a phenomenal team. We employ close to 400 people now. Um, and I would love to say to you and sit here and take the credit for it all, but I can't. The credit goes to my team. Credit goes to them helping me realise the vision. And our vision now is to create the world's largest residential park home operation. We're currently Europe's. We've got a long way to go. Hey, who cares? It's going to be a great journey. Well, you certainly made the right decision getting involved with it. And obviously... Your success speaks for itself. You've managed to open 93 homes. That's not including the holiday ones in a 20 year period. Like, that's absolutely phenomenal. Like, how have you managed to expand at that rate over the past 20 years? Our business has a value of circa some 750 million pound. Unbelievable. Our borrowings with HSBC and Santander, currently as we speak now, is 65 million pounds. So we're a very, very, very under-leveraged business. But every penny that we get goes back into the business. Every single penny that we get gets reinvested. Everything that I've ever bought has a value to be sold so we can then reinvest that money when it's needed back into the business. Yes. And staying focused on the business that we have, making ourselves the experts making customers reassured that we are the people to deal with. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm sure the way you've been going, and like I said, the expansion you've had in such a, such a period, uh, I'm sure you will go on to become the world's leader at a certain point. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about goal setting and dreams, aspirations, because you must have massively passed your dreams and expectations and dreams that you must have had as a child. Um, I, get up, I get up and pinch myself every morning. I feel like a Premier League football player that's playing for captain of England and managing to put the ball in the back of the net. My goals now are just to win the World Cup. 
What I would say to you is, and what a lot of people don't understand is this. Everybody, me, you, and every one of my team, and everybody on the street is a world-class athlete, but in different ways. Don't expect, just because you like football, don't expect to be the world's best footballer. You might be the world's best plumber. You might be the world's best electrician. But some people fail to recognise the skill set it takes to be anything. Mm. But the most important thing is to be focused on what you want to be, whether it's electrician, whether it's a plumber, whether it's a computer programmer, whether it's a footballer. Because what people forget, a football player, that's his business. That's his profession. Yep. That's what he does. Now we're footballers, and I'll use footballers as an example, but it could be boxers, it could be basketball players, it could be any other sportsman. Where they sometimes get let down is their all careers are up front. So their career starts when they're 16, all the way to say when they're 30 or maybe 35. But after that, they don't have a career. So it's about, it's the opposite way round for somebody that's in business. My career starts later in life. And it's about the learning beforehand. But the learning that I have beforehand learns me what to do with money, how to invest money. And money is like your army. You send all those little soldiers out. Those soldiers conquer another army. And they bring that army back. Sometimes they lose a battle or two, but as long as they're winning most of the battles. Yep. So in terms of goal setting, you said choose a nice simple goal to start with, achieve that before you start trying to diver off on other sort of tasks and other goals, and then once you've achieved that, then you can start trying to achieve more goals and set. Think more. of a think of a goal like a ladder. Really simple. A ladder is one of the most successful implements. It takes you from the bottom to the top. But what you must never do is step to the side because you'll fall off and have to start again. And if you try to step or swing to the side or reach for another ladder, you'll fall off. One step, two steps, three steps, all the way parallel. You stay focused on the next step of the ladder. Don't look to the left, don't look to the right, stay focused. Yep. And it will take you from the bottom to the top. Mm, indeed. And another thing, um, <laughs> drive. Like, where do you get your drive from, obviously? When you were younger and you had less, obviously it's natural, we all want the best things in life. But at this stage now, when you have hundreds of millions, you could quite easily be in the Barbados in one of your mansions out there on the balcony, like say, looking at the most beautiful view. But instead you're working every day. Yep. Where does that drive come from, Alfie, especially at this stage now today? For me, there's two points of drive. When I started, I started because it was financially motivated. No, no ifs, not buts. May, people may find it shallow, but that's exactly what my motivation was. Just financial gain. When I then came into the mobile home park sector, I found a passion. I not only found a passion that I loved, I found a passion that I was good at. And it was still about the money then. But then as the company has grown, the money has taken second place. And it's now about the passion of changing the face of affordable housing. And I had the opportunity, as Alfie Best, to change that sector and create a legacy. A legacy that will live on way beyond me. The reason that Wildcrest is called Wildcrest, it's a made up word, it doesn't exist. But do you know what I'm really privileged about? It's one of the few companies and it's the only mobile home park company to ever get its endorsement as a Wikipedia page. Now, from a company that's a made up word, and the reason that the word is made up, it's wild crest, but it's actually misspelled because it's actually spelt wildy crest. There's a reason for it. I knew that when Google first came out, you needed a brand that nobody else typed in. 
most people copied somebody else's name. So if they wanted to sell tyres, they'd go Dunlop Tyres. But what they didn't realise was customers are astute. They want the real Dunlop tyre if they're typing in Dunlop. So they'll skip you. They'll look at your website but skip to the real one. Whereas I wanted them to go direct to our website. So it meant us building our own brand. And we created a brand that you typed in the name. It took us to the top of Google without paying for it. Absolutely. It's uh, a little tip again for people. Constant tips coming from you today. And I saw um, your mobile phone business previously was... Was it called Vodatech once you sold Vodatech. it, or you initially called it Vodatech? I initially called it Vodatech. reason it was called Voda was because of Vodafone. I know I couldn't call it Vodafone, yep. but I wanted it to be ahead of Vodafone. So I called it Tech. So it was Vodatech. And we actually were nicking their traffic. Incredible. And like I say, you ended up selling off to them in the end. Yes. And it's similar to the other tip you put in the book about the fast food restaurants, the big fast food restaurants, whether it be Domino's you mentioned specifically in the book, and if there's ever a, a space next to one of these outlets, open up, get it straight away. Let me say this to you, if you want to create track, look, if you want to go to a nightclub, you want to go where there's five or six, so you've got choice. People get frightened of competition, where well, what they don't realise is competition's good. Competition gives you levels to work at. Competition and allows you to improve your game, improve your business acumen, to learn. One of the major setbacks we have in our company here is we're the biggest park operator by a mile. So it's us that's learning the rest of the, and I, and I don't want that to sound condescending, but it's a fact. But our team, we train, and we spend a lot of money on training our colleagues including me because I want to learn every day you know we make mistakes every day but we're learning from them absolutely so there's going to be obviously thousands of people that look at you would love to be where you are today but it seems unreachable when you're talking about 700 million and stuff like this but going back to the ladder thing a minute ago so it's going to be people thinking right I'd love to, I want to get into the property game I love what he's done obviously to start with it's impossible to get a mobile home park, something like this. You started through residential properties. And so what would be your, say the number, the first step you should do if you've got, say 20,000 or 30,000 there, or maybe a bit more? Start with one property. And stop looking at everybody else that's got five, 10, 15, 20. That's like playing in the Sunday league team and looking at Manchester United and going, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna play against them. You wouldn't even think that, would you? You wouldn't even consider it. So why would you do the same in business? It's about starting with one property, but start. But most importantly, do your homework. And, start, and make sure what property you want to buy. I, you know, I, I hear the, the word HMO banded around. I hear the word, you know, uh, terrace conversion and loft, loft conversions. And such for these snazzy words that property investors want to sell to you to show you that you know they know more than the next person. The truth of the matter is, there are so many different sectors of property. And you've got to see what floats your boat, what excites you a little bit. Is it residential property? Is it commercial property? Is it car garages? Is it storage? Is it retail high street? You know, where, are you, where do you feel that you already have a skill set? Did you work in a shop at one point? Did you work in a bakery? Maybe that you want to fit out a bakery and rent, because you know that sector. Yep. Don't try to start at ground zero. Try to start a step or two up the ladder by, by taking the knowledge you already have. Mm. And that knowledge can come from the terraced house where you used to live and the outside bathroom was outside. That you know that you can then convert, add an extension. Try not to start from ground zero because somebody's telling you you don't know when yes. you haven't really channeled through your own memory banks to know what you already, you've already done through your life. Absolutely, so don't try and follow someone's story or path like yourself rigidly 
choose what's correct for yourself and then try and take tips from yes. successful people and yeah. not be adaptable. One of the greatest things that I heard was Warren Buffett met Bill Gates for the first time. And Bill Gates' mum said to Warren Buffett, no, so apologies, Bill Gates' mum said to both of them, what is it that made you successful? And astonishingly, they said the same answer. And what do you think it was? Hard work. Focus. Focus, yeah. Which is hard work. Staying focused on what you're doing. But you can be hard working without being focused, yes, can't you? you can be absolutely. A at the same time. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I know loads of people that are busy, been... but they don't stay focused. Yeah. They are off on this tangent, off on that. The next big goal, the next big thing. For instance, I, I take my son. For instance, Alfie. I am so privileged now, and I've been hard on him as a son from where I've been hard on him. But I couldn't be more blessed as a father now because he's found his niche. He loves, you know, his, his company's called, you know, the best kettles in Hatton Garden. He's done all of that. And what anybody says, himself. Not one bit of help from me. So now I know I've done my job because the hard bit is actually being hard. 100%. That's the hard bit. The easy bit is, there you go. Do you understand? That's the easy bit. The hard bit is biting your lip and being hard. Yes. But by being hard, they become nobody's fault. And they will then take towels from that. They'll take lessons from that. They'll understand the value of money. They'll understand the value of business, value of good contacts. And they'll also value the time. And now, to be fair, uh, as a father, I couldn't be any more prouder on what he's done. And I see all these little Twitter trolls. I had, uh, there was one that, uh, that sent a, uh, a Twitter message to Alfie, but, it, but he wrote it to me. And he said, oh, he said, you... Uh, your dad's given you all the money. It was him that set you up. Which, please believe me, as much as I'd like to admit that, it's not true. So I text back because I couldn't help myself. You're absolutely right. My dad gave me everything. Obviously, yours gave you nothing. But I couldn't help myself. No. Do you follow me? But with all, what I would say to all of these people that are that are being badgered by these non-existent, faceless trolls. Take strength from it. Because they're there using up free space what could be used somewhere else in their own mind, housing you. And all the time they're housing you, you're on their lips. Good, bad or indifferent. I've actually got one person that's got a hate page against me. I love it. That means you made it once you start getting all this sort of stuff, doesn't it? And it's uh, they're putting all their energy into you. And I'd like I said, go back to Alfie. Congratulations on the job you've done with Alfie. He's a credit to you. And, uh, Thank you, guys uh, who haven't seen. We have previously interviewed Alfie, so go back and have a look at Alfie's interview as well at Hatton Gardens at his shop, and it was uh, fantastic. If I can say so, I think it was a great interview. I think it was very honest, and I did watch the interview, yeah. and I felt warmed because. Some of the stuff that he was saying, he actually didn't realise how much effort went into it and how much hardship, because the boxing, for instance, we trained like pros, the only, and, and genuinely we did. Um, and he is a very, very, very talented, um, and, um, this is not a father's love saying this, genuinely not a father's love. He was good enough um, to be a world champion. Is it something that I would say everybody should do? This is what I believe. Boxing should be in every school because it tames the bullies and it makes confidence for the shy. And I think that 
is is what we're lacking sometimes in this country, especially now, yeah. where we seem to have these f- keyboard warriors for no reason. I, I'll never understand it. Yeah, I'm a big advocate of getting children into boxing at a young age. I feel like I was lacking some skills that maybe the confidence and stuff like this, that if I'd been doing boxing as a child, that I might have been a bit more of a leader than a follower at certain points and been swayed by peer pressure so much. Um, so like I said, my, my little boy's seven years old. I've had him boxing for three years with John Edwards over in Guildford. Yeah, no, I know, John. What, what I would say to you is this. I never hardly see many boxers getting many fights yeah. outside of the ring. I'm not saying they don't, yes. but I'm saying the, the actual, because they know the other guy hits just as hard. And actually, I see more people that can have a fight and hold their hands up, talk their way out of it, rather than have the, have the fight. Absolutely. So, um, like I said, I heavily recommend people getting into it. I hear that Alfie's uh, having an, another fight in a couple of months' time. Yep. So, um, I think he's fighting in, in October. October, yeah. Yeah, so we'll probably go back and see Alfie before that and uh, find out how he's preparing. And uh, He's down at Cambly Boxing Club, isn't he? He's fighting away and he's uh, getting back into his training. So it's great to have so much drive when he's having so much success business-wise and other things to be doing that sort of stuff. Um, and one thing that you said a minute ago is... Um, it's so easy to spoil your children. And obviously, I'm not in a position that you are or a position you have been in the past. And I find it very hard not to spoil my boy. Like I said, I get him into the boxing, so he has to work hard. It's so hard not to buy them stuff. And that's the easiest thing to do, isn't it? Look. Do you know what I think? And this comes on me and anybody else. I think it's a guilt trip that we have. Because look, I didn't have a, a lot of time um, uh, for my children. Um, and that's a failing on my part. That is a failing on my part. But I think that I've made up for it in other ways. Would I change anything? You can't change the past. So don't even think about changing anything. Yes. Only look to embrace uh, the future. And like me and Alfie have done some incredible things together. We did a, a road trip across America. We did Route 66. It was great. Um, and the boxing brought us together much more than I think any other sport. Um, the, the, the hard thing I think about kids, we all want them to do well. We all want them to do well. And if somebody said to me, what would be the best lesson you could say about being a father? And the answer is I really couldn't tell you. Because I think every child is different and every dad is different. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I don't think there's no... Um, there's certainly no book that I've ever seen, and I've read a few, on, um, on, on parenting. And the reason I don't think you can start to put kids in a system of saying that's how you should bring them up is it because then becomes a school. And the moment it becomes a school... Some kids excel at school and some kids don't. Well, I don't think that's because they're silly. I think they're in the wrong school. And I've seen kids change schools and excel. It's all about the people around you. And the one piece of advice that I would give to anybody is always look at your circle very, very deeply. And if your circle has only got negative things to say about other people, change your circle. Absolutely. And um, because a lot of people end up messing up at school, at college, and they think their life's over as such. But obviously, you're living proof that you left school at an early age, and even your son, Alfie, left school at an early age. And are you an advocate? Do you you think the exams mean that much in today's, in terms of his success in life or the pivotal? I would never say that education is 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 a bad thing i'd say that education is key is a massive thing i wish that i'd studied harder i wish that alfie had done more schooling that's the honest truth for mm. me. but it's a balancing act alfie was at work alfie had a driver going out selling products he was all he was at school in a different way now what i would say to you is what i do believe what we're lacking in the UK, is more and more children should have one day a week off 
from the age of 12 onwards and they have to go and do a job. And, a, and, and companies like mine should say, okay, we'll take one pupil in each department on those days. And the businesses take on board educating the students because that's the real world. Absolutely. When you, like, I um, have a helicopter. When you're learning to fly a helicopter, they don't give you your lessons and then go, there's the keys. You have to do hours of training, 50 hours plus of training, with a pilot flying the machine. Isn't life like that? But yet they expect people to be educated and then throw them out in the world. Life's not like that. Mm. So I believe education is key. But what I also feel is key is this, that the people in the school you must gel with. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. And you must also have time out in businesses or jobs that you want to do. You're already getting experience on a level that you would never get. You're not having to wait till you're 25. Absolutely. So um, you previously just mentioned the helicopters. Obviously, you're in a fortunate position in life that you've been able to treat yourself to some of the luxuries and the fancy things in life, whether it be the helicopters. You've just uh, recently bought your second Bugatti. Yep. And I say a massive congratulations Thank on you. that. Absolutely incredible. So now you've got the Veyron and the Chiron, and the Chiron. which is uh, insane. Um, but touching on the helicopters, you ended up um, having a crash last year. Um, 2000, two, 2018. Two, two, well, I think it was no. uh, November 2018. So, so yeah, two and a half years ago. And uh, I was in a Robinson 44. I was learning to fly. And uh, we were doing uh, safety landings on and off, on and off. And um, we had uh, a rotary failure. But I managed to get the helicopter down. But as it was coming down, it hit... Uh, hit the ground hard and had vertical rollover but mm. I got myself out the pilot was knocked out because I was there with a trainee pilot I pulled him out and he was in intensive care for a week but and I got out with a nick underneath my face Jesus uh, what what made the rotary failure happen then uh, I think it was error on my part oh, um, oh, oh, uh, over stipulation with the pedals I think possibly called a lever to go ok and so this hasn't Put you off helicopters, in there. No. Let me say this to you. Helicopters is one of the safest transport in the world. Yeah. You know, the if you look at the amount of crashes that are involved, the amount of people that are, that are killed or injured in helicopters into any other aviation, it's actually less. Okay. And so was there a few month period after, obviously, the accident where you thought... I went flying the next day. Jesus. I turned up at the airport. We've still got the videos to this, which I'll give to you. But I went there the very next day got to get back on the horse yeah tough man got to get back on the horse if you don't get on the horse the horse is going to be in control of you mm -hmm. that's fantastic and uh so it's again congratulations you've got a you've ordered a new helicopter you've got arriving shortly this yeah is, i've got uh, a new ec-130 airbus which is designed and fitted out by aston martin fantastic can't wait to see i think there's only seven of them in the whole of the world um but look it's Genuinely, it's used for business. For me to get round, if you think about it, I've got 93 parks. So it will take me um, a year and a half, no, two years, to drive around every park once a week. So it's impossible to do. Yes. So for me, a helicopter is like a time machine. It gets me from A to B to C to D, and I can visit five parks in a day. And so can you just land on the parks as such? Pretty much, yeah. 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 And so, how much time would it sort of save? Like, how quickly could you get from here to Liverpool or something like this? Something that's sort of a six, seven hour journey. Okay. I could fly. Uh, live it from here to Liverpool is what, six hours? Yeah. Yeah. I could fly to it from here to Liverpool in two hours. Jesus. It's a, it's a lot, you know, in getting and flying. And what's, what about the fuel costs and stuff like this to find out? Burn rate on an EC120 is about £150 an hour. Um, so it's about 300 quid in fuel. Yeah. I, I never fly without a safety pilot. 
um, and then you've got your obviously servicing costs. So the running cost of a helicopter, the actual physical, if you own the machine like we do, it's about £500 an hour by the time you take into account all of your insurance, your expenses, all of the costs that go with it, the servicing, the maintenance. Mm, indeed, it was fantastic. Like I said, congratulations. I look forward to seeing this uh, Aston Martin helicopter. Um, let's talk to me about these Bugattis you've got there. You've got the Veyron and then most recently the Chiron. Talk to me about these vehicles then and what made you... The reason I bought those, and I'm going to be really honest, as shallow as it may sound, they're a great marketing tool. A fantastic marketing tool. We own several different companies. We wrap them um and uh, we send them out we've also got a six wheel g wagon unbelievable yeah and we wrap them and they're iconic vehicles because they're iconic they're photographed everywhere so whatever you're advertising they sell yeah and i've seen that you can actually rent out the six by six via pt prestige yep. executive travel in birmingham via lord Lehman. absolutely and the sheer and the chiron and the veil and the chiron as well so and the straight chiron away that's it yes and that's the, the carbon fibre, isn't it? The, yep. They've all got to earn money. Absolutely. Everything's a business for you as such. Um, absolutely incredible. If it, if it isn't generating revenue, then what it's doing is costing you. Yes. And anything that costs you will only drag you under. Mm. Indeed. So, um, earlier on we touched on the recession, the 1990 recession. And... We spoke about what you did maybe wrong at that time there, maybe spread yourself didn't, too thin as such. Didn't, didn't see it coming. I didn't, I didn't quarter myself and regulate myself for that recession. The recessions that came after, so far, so far, I've regulated them very, very well. We've used them as stepping stones. Yes. And our businesses have excelled in those recessions. Well, it certainly seems like it might. It was a very important lesson you maybe learned in 1990, because obviously since then you said one of the keys is distress acquisitions that you've become very good at. And um, obviously in the most recent sort of semi-recession 18 months ago, you've ended up buying Varum, mm -hmm. um, mobile uh, home rentals. Um, yeah, it's motor home rentals. Yeah, and so talk to me about that then, obviously the danger of buying in recession or in a time like this. We um, bought Varum. The company that we bought was called Unbeatable Hire. It went into receivership, owing an awful lot of money to a lot of people. We bought the assets and we kept a lot of the investors that were already there on board. We set up a new company called Varun Motorhome Hire. That's now the third largest motorhome hire company in the UK. It went from 1.5 stars to 4.6 stars over the last two years. We've taken it from a company that was losing money to I believe that we're gonna hit close to a million pounds profit. And it's a company now that's on target to be worth 20 million pound or more. And it's another company that will grow into a European brand. Um, Varum was a phenomenal brand to buy because even though we set it up, I had to go out and find the, band, the, the, the brand that I wanted. And Varun had had 20 million pounds spent on it, um, uh, on the television, because it was used for buying and selling cars before that. Yeah. So I bought that brand, put it onto, and I loved it, because it was va, as in vum vum, room. So Varun, it has a, something behind it. And again, it was misspelt. Because it was misspelled, we then had the traffic that was behind it. But what an incredible purchase that's looking like today, especially with what's happened over the last 18 months, the travel restrictions and all this sort of stuff. It was just an absolute golden touch, wasn't it? Um, well, that. it wasn't when I bought it. Because I got locked down the vir virtually the next week. Locked down, vehicles couldn't go out, nobody could do anything. Now, we had to find a way around that. Otherwise, the company would have lost... £70,000 a month. Yes. So what we did was we had the vehicles completely isolated, decontaminated uh, for COVID, and we hired them out to people who wanted a second room to isolate outside the property. It's about finding the niche. 
and finding solutions and... to problems. For instance, I mentioned earlier where I felt the government had got it wrong with some of their decisions that they made. They closed pubs down. Why? Why? Why would you close the pubs down? Well, obvious. Their reasoning is they don't want people to congregate together. But what they did was they closed the pubs, shut those businesses. So overnight, they sterilised a whole complete sector within the economy. And then promoted another business unknowingly. And that was the high street and the um, uh, uh, massive stores selling alcohol. What they should have done was said, pubs are licensed to sell alcohol. They can sell it online. They can sell it click and collect. And we're limiting the amount of alcohol that the stores can sell. Okay, so bringing down the alcohol in one revenue place, but keeping one business afloat. It was so simple to do. And instead, they just said, you're shut. But the food stores can carry on selling alcohol. So, why? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's puzzling to me, but I've uh, uh, got obviously the wealth of knowledge and success like yourself, but which, is politics something that you'd consider getting into in the future and putting your skills, the skills that you've learned and obviously... I don't think that I'm... Look, to be a politician, as far as I can see, you need to be somebody that is educated at Oxford and you need to be within that sector. You know, I hate to say it, but that's pretty well how our front bencher politicians seem to be. Yeah. You know, I don't see anybody coming from my local manor. And that's that's a shame. Yes, indeed. That is a shame. And you could say, well, I can't say you can say that. You go back through history, even up to Boris Johnson. It's amazing how many of them are all in the same picture that's sitting on the front bench. Might be the odd one or two, but most of them are from the forgive me for the saying, from the same public school that they were all at. Absolutely. So there's no point in sort of wasting your time trying to get into something that's... Why well, try to change something when the whole sec- section is against you? Why not to try to change something and make the better of something that you can? And that's housing. Yes. So I can make a difference. And I am making a difference. Indeed. And um, in terms of your political views, though, I've seen in the past you've been a big supporter of the Conservative Party. Mm-hmm. You're still a big supporter of them? and I'm, a, I'm not a supporter of the Conservative Party. Yes. I'm not a supporter of Labour. I'm not a supporter of the Liberal Dems. I'm a supporter of the person. Mm. For instance, love him or hate him, I was a fan of Tony Blair. Yes. I was a fan... Um, of our previous Conservative um, Prime Minister Um, and I'm going to be really honest with you he's my uh, uh, David Cameron yes and yet now and I was an advocate of David Cameron's whereas now I think he's the worst Prime Minister that we've ever had because a Prime Minister takes that job to lead his country. A Prime Minister takes that job to lead his people. Yes. Not to throw his toys out the pram and say, I asked for what I didn't want, I got what I didn't like, so I'm leaving. We were the laughing stock of the country. We were the laughing stock of the world. That our Prime Minister that was voted in by us didn't like what he got, so he left. Well, don't ask for it. Well, you see him now, he was in court at the moment and how much money he made from certain contracts he gave out and certain businesses and all this sort of stuff. I mean, how many of these politicians are actually there for the benefit of the country and trying to improve the country and rather than their own needs, you know? Look, I just, I, I was, I, I feel that Theresa May didn't get a, a, a fair crack of the whip because Labour, who I turned more against because of... Um, 
Gordon. Um, Brown. What's Gordon Brown? The Charles no, not Gordon. Tom no, not Gordon Brown. Sorry, um, I've even forgot his name uh, again. What is it? The, the last Labour leader. Um, <laughs> what was it? Remember. Jeremy Corbyn. Oh, yeah. oh, he's yeah. Yes, terrible. Jeremy Corbyn. I didn't dislike him for some of his views that they put up. I disliked him that he made so many disgruntled nonsense challenges to get us out of Brexit. And by the way, I was against Brexit. But once the decision had been made, that's what our country had voted for. Let's deal with it. Let's not try and undo our shoelaces and trip each other up. That's, that's what the Prime Minister asked us to vote on. People voted on it. I would have preferred to have stayed. It's not the case. That's what our country is for. We're supposed to live in a democracy. Absolutely. They made it look more like an undemocracy and a dictatorship. And they looked like children flowing, throwing their toys out of the pram. You've got David Cameron resigning because he can't lead the country because, you know, I asked you what you wanted and you told me what I didn't like, so I'm leaving. That's it. Crazy. Put it in a nutshell how you like, but that's it. You've now got Jeremy Corbyn. Anything and everything Theresa May or Boris Johnson put up, he was against. Instead of on that one pinnacle point coming together and saying, you know, listen, Let's work together as a team on this. Let's get it out of it. Once afterwards, our view can change. Mm -hmm. Our country has voted for it. Let's work together. Absolutely. And that's why I just it didn't work for me. Boris Johnson, am I, am I a fan of? Um, I think he's a bit of an egotistic maniac, personally. But I do think he did a great job with Brexit considering everything that was against him. And Brexit now seems like a minor. With everything else that's going on now. With yes. everything else yeah, that's it's going on. Yeah, it's aside, hasn't it? But so, he's certainly been governing the country at a difficult time, hasn't he? Listen, he, when he's took it on, let, let's be honest, he took it on with Brexit, Covid's hit him, I think there have been some mistakes made there. But overall, you have to give that man credit where credit is due. Absolutely. Because the Brexit scenario, which seems like a lifetime away now, was the poison chalice. And it was the poison chalice because the opposition and different parts of the country were still trying to undo it. We'd made the choice. Whether I was for it or whether I was against it, I'd go with what the team votes. Whether it's business, whether it's politics, whether it's our country. This is our country. We need to make it great. Mm. You know, the greatest speech that I ever heard was by John F. Kennedy. Don't ask what you can, what your country can do for you. Ask for what you can do for it. And we need to start we need to start living that a little bit more in the UK. Everybody seems to want to rely on our country. Come on, let's see what we can do for it. Yeah, it's not going to get much further if everyone's taking, 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 is it? So, um, enough changing the topic slightly. On talking about your traveller roots. And your traveller heritage, obviously, you've become a massively successful person now. Are you, are you still in touch with your traveller roots and your heritage? Do you still surround yourself with traveller people and people yeah. in the gypsy community? Yeah, of course. Let me say this to you it's not about where a man is from, it's where he's going. But if a horse is born in the stable, It'll always remember being born in the stable. It'll always be a horse. I have people say to me that they're gypsies or travellers. I don't know very well they're not. Just because a dog is born in the stable doesn't make it a horse. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So it's about culture. It's about knowing where you're from. It's about knowing what you are. Mm. And so obviously you're the most successful travelling man in this country. Um, in terms of helping other travellers and the gypsy community, do you always try and help people? Uh, you know. Look, I'm not going to paint myself up as some do-gooder. Far from it. Um, uh, we Do I help other travellers? I can't say that I do, no. That, yeah. that's, that's an honest answer. But I would never, ever, ever 
be against them. I'd always be with my own people. Mm. Why? Because we've been persecuted for so long. I'm one of the few people, especially in business, that has ever come out. Um, and I think one of the best blessings I've had is where Alfie's been concerned. Um, he stood up and said, yeah, earlier than I ever did. Because don't forget, you know, being a gypsy comes with a stigma. Gypsies, tramps and thieves. Bar Bar Black Sheep gets banned as a song, but Cher can sing about them being liars, cheats and thieves. I actually quite like the song, to be fair with you. But my point, it puts it into perspective. Mm, absolutely. And um, I saw a few years ago you had a little bit of trouble with an in-law. Obviously, we don't need to touch on that at all, but obviously where there was trouble there, you could have gone to the police about a certain situation, but instead you decided to have, well, if the paper's correct, you decided to have a... Fight. A bare-knuckle fight instead, yep. which is incredible for someone of your wealth, but obviously, like I said, you haven't got away from your let upbringing. Me, let me say this to you. In life, people forget where you've come from. And in life, people think you've become a victim. And uh, I did go there to have a fair fight. He couldn't beat me, so he had to pull out a machete. Um, but he didn't, to be fair with you, I grabbed the machete um, and took it off of him because he didn't have the kahunas to use it. Thank God he didn't, is, is the honest answer of it. Um, but look, what's in you is in you. Fair play to you, Alfie, because like I said, you had so much success, it's so easy to get away from certain things, but you're still a man's man. What I would say to you is this, look, I don't want to be any different than I was yesterday, um, but I do want to improve as a person every day. And if you go in, if you ride a horse, you've got to know, know how to stay in the saddle. Don't ever expect anybody else to do it for you and say you know how to ride. Mm. For me, whatever comes, snow or blow, I'll stand solid. Absolutely, and like I said, uh, congratulations, you're a real man's man and someone to look up to. Um, so talk to me about your plans for the next couple of years then, what we could expect to see from your empire and the growth and stuff like this. Obviously I'm sure it's going to be continuously growing. What are your sort of set dreams and goals for we personal a, and for the business? We have a five year plan um, to double in size. That's a, a, a big ask, but I think we can do it. We've set our, our business plan to get us there. and. Uh, now it's no longer, as I said earlier, about the financial gain. The financial gain is irrelevant. This is actually about how much more good we can do in the industry, um, how much more we can improve, and how much of a legacy the company can still keep taking on. And it isn't just my dream, it's actually our team's dream. And they're part of that team. You don't see it called Alfie Best Parks. You see it called Wild Crest, so everybody can share in that. Excellent. And we employ every creed, colour and race. I don't know if you've been through the offices yet, but we employ everybody. Because I'm not employing somebody of an ilk. I'm employing the person who can do the job better than the next person. And I'm, I want to employ peace and people with passion. And what I have found is... By bringing in people from different cultures, they bring in some magic. They bring in some flair. And I would say we are the closest company you'll find that's working like an American company. Because when I've gone there, I've taken how I see how they work. Now, America is a country of immigrants. But yet it works well because they take the little bit of magic from one culture, a little bit of another, and it's working. You look at Dubai, even though you have the locals, which are, you know, in transit of what they are, um, it, it's a country that's made up of immigrants now, and it's exploded. I believe that that's had some, okay, the government has done a phenomenal job there growing their country, but you can't tell me that bringing in those different cultures from different countries has not helped explode, certainly helped us. Absolutely. But you, you say obviously you're not so much focused on the, the figures these days. And the 
but surely you're going to breach the billion pound mark yeah, at yeah. some point over we, the next few years. When's that? How we value, uh, how I value myself is on an asset value. I don't value it on the value of the company. Yeah. So um, we had Duff and Phelps come in and they valued our business um, because they did an audit on us and it was them that come up with the figure of, of the company. But the value how I value it is much less than that because I value it just on the assets because I'm one of these people that thinks, hold on a minute, goodwill, structure, all of that is great, but it's to me, it's service. I'm looking at what the assets are worth if something should go wrong. What do we need to sell if we had to, to cover our costs? Does that make sense? Absolutely. So in five years, I believe that we will be at a billion pounds in assets. Company-wise, I believe we'll be at two billion pounds. So it depends how you value it. And that's the honest truth. Incredible. Do you know when you've got so many businesses so many figures thinking about this and that, this there, that's going wrong. It's, I can imagine it must be so all-consuming. Again, if I had to think of all those things, I wouldn't be successful. Yeah, so that's... The managing directors of those businesses are very focused and they're extremely focused on what their goals are. And I don't allow them to overlap or interlink unless we're doing cross-selling. Yeah. Or cross supply to cut costs or to increase sales. Yeah. But when it comes to those businesses, I have the best people, the most consumed people who love those businesses. I then have a report back and I work as a mentor to mentoring them, not being an expert, being an expert in the field of somebody to help them grow that business. So yeah. they're working as if it is their business. Yeah, because I think obviously that's massively important. Obviously it relieves the stress of you and allows you to you look in great health at your age and allows you to be in this I'm only really 21, position. did you not know that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's going back to when you were 21, you ended up having a big health scare during the recession times. You ended up having a slight problem with your heart. I don't heart know. 30 I don't years know. ago. And so obviously you have to do the right things to make sure. I, I run every day. I train with a personal trainer three times a day. I still do a little bit of boxing, yeah. um, not for any particular reason, uh, but just to stay fit. Absolutely. Um, so talking about, obviously, you're someone who's got so many assets, but you still borrow. Talk to me about how important it is to have good finance um, and uh, a good credit rating, obviously, at early age in order to expand and create an empire. Utilisation of money is like water. Most people think utilisation of money is to spend. Don't confuse the two. An investment is something that is going to generate you revenue back. And there are so many different types of investment and it, you can get lost in the minefield of it. For us, we could work for a period of say, three years and pay off all of our debts completely and be debt free. One, it wouldn't be tax efficient to do that. Two, that would slow our growth down yeah. in the company. Yeah. And number three, most of all, it keeps us very focused. It keeps us very focused knowing that there is a debt level there that has to be paid. Nobody becomes subdued and, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. And they question every invoice. Are we being charged the right amount? Are they being fair with us as a supplier? Absolutely. So guys, make sure, don't dismiss it because you've got a load of cash in, the, in there at home. You've got to have a good credit rate and you've got to have a good relationship with the banks the whole time. Well, think about it this way. Let me put this in, because we're bordering on to something else, which is property investments. So let me, if I can, for, the, for a quick three minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Please. Let's say I've got 20,000 pounds and I want to buy one house for 100,000 pounds and put 20,000 pounds in. Now, in a market where there is growth, it's fantastic. When you're in a recession, it's even better. But what you should do is not buy one house. 
you split it and you buy one house and convert it into two flats. So you've now got two properties generating two rents. You then, with the other 10,000, because you've split it, once you have that up and running, generating the revenue, paying your mortgage, there's only one way it can go, is up over a period of time. Property is a long-term investment, but a very healthy one. Mm. You then straight away, with the other 10,000, buy another property with a further mortgage. The reason you don't do it together is because you have to make mistakes. So learn by the mistakes with the first one and don't make them on the second. Absolutely. Now you have two assets, but the bank is gonna be at say two and a half percent, your interest repayment. Your property will be increasing in value. But it's not increasing in value just on the 10,000, is it? It's increasing in value on the 90,000. So now you've got two properties and the level of investment that's going up over one year, two years, three years is going up on the level of 100,000. So it's going up on the bank's money. Yes. But you're not paying for that. You're only paying the interest on the bank. And always think of the bank as your partner. Be honest with the bank. A bank manager loves honest people. He's an expert at this. When he finished with you, he's going to go and speak to somebody else about lending money to them. Then he's going to speak. He's an expert. So he'll tell you where the pitfalls are. And if a bank doesn't want to lend you the money, Ask them why. Find out the reasons. Is it you're a bad credit risk? What does that mean? Is it you? If it's you, that's fine. That's fine, you need to go to another bank. Is it the property? Is it it doesn't pay itself back? Remember, they're experts. You're getting this advice for free from them. So why would you, too many people dismiss what the bank's got to say because they're focused on getting the loan, don't be. Be focused on the whole thing. Yeah, the feedback that you get, everything is, uh, like I say, it's free advice, isn't it? So it's... Every time I take a loan, I ask the bank for advice. Absolutely. And what so, I do with it is up to me. Yes, and so you know for people like who are out there, people who are watching this, and they're, so they're looking to get into an industry, is property the the number one industry that you'd say to get into or recommend getting into? All I can tell you is this, we have 67 million people on here. We have a small island and people don't seem to be stopped coming. Cool, so uh, people need somewhere to live, don't they? Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time today, Alfie. It's been greatly, greatly appreciated for giving someone like us the time of day to even come down here and meet you. It's um, been an absolute pleasure and I've, I've learned a lot from obviously reading your book in the past couple of weeks, I've learned a lot more today. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people watching this who are going to learn a lot from you, Alfie. Thank you very much for coming. It's always a privilege when somebody says something good, um, but it's not about saying the good. Try and act upon anything that you want to do. That's what I would say to everybody. Do what you love, and you'll never work another day in your life. Yeah, indeed. Um, is there any shout-outs you'd like to give to any specific team members or anyone in particular? Um, um, what is a shout out? So to say a thank you or mention a certain member, whether it be your son or any the people who've been working hard or um, who've done well for you of late. Is there anyone in particular you'd like to mention today? There will be way too many, and if you picked one, I'd be criticised for not picking another. Absolutely, that's the problem when you've got such a big team, you know. But um, yeah, like I said again, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure and I hope to be able to do this again with you one day at some point. 100%. Feel free to download the full podcast on all major streaming sites, including iTunes, 
Apple Music and Spotify. Also, check out the KRN store and grab yourself the latest KRN merchandise and accessories using the keyword KRN10 for 10% discount on all purchases. Thanks for listening and enjoy the interview.